when you have children, always remember your child is not the source of your frustration, of your anger, and of your stress. Dory 1, this is Fireteam Delta. Dad's coming home. Welcome to the Military Veteran Dad Podcast, where it is our mission to bring every dad home. I am your host, Ben Colloy. I'm a United States Marine veteran, husband, and a father. We will bring authentic conversations to inspire action in your life so we can close the gap between the dad you are today and the dad you want to be tomorrow. This is the Military Veteran Dad Podcast. Welcome back to Military Veteran Dad. This is episode 116. I am your host, Ben Colloy, and it is Monday, April 5th, just like I said I was, we are back here with interview shows, and guys, let me tell you, this episode does not disappoint. If I couldn't have picked a better episode to come back firing in the barrel with, because the round is in the chamber, and it is going down range, and this episode with Roy Moore is absolutely incredible. I first met Roy through an introduction on LinkedIn, and this introduction We just hit it off instantly. He was a Marine in active duty at Cannell Penton, and it was just a great conversation. He's got over almost 20 years active duty in the Marine Corps, just a breadth of experience within the military service. He's got three young daughters, just an amazing man and human being. And this conversation goes in a lot of different places, but it goes in one particular spot, and it becomes a dominant point of our conversation And that is self-leadership. And that is the title of this episode. It will be the main theme in this episode. And it's not something I've done a lot of talking about. But ever since I recorded this episode, it has been something I've been diving into even deeper. I recorded this episode even before the break on the interview show. And man, it has already been hitting the ground running with different things going on. So without further ado... Let's just get started with Roy Moore. And and as always, as tradition, if you want to hear my biggest takeaway, head back to the end of this episode and hang on to the end, and I'll be back with you to share my big takeaway. Welcome to the podcast, Roy. How are you doing? I am doing awesome. And this conversation has been building for like, I feel like three months now is how long we've yeah. known each other. And you gave me a big, giant gift when we first met because you were sitting in Camp Pendleton in your Marine uniform, and I'm here sitting with the chaos of virtual learning going on, and I'm thinking, like, there's chaos outside the door, and I get an awesome opportunity to talk to another Marine on active duty at Kent Pendleton in uniform, and it was a big, giant gift within the, the nonsense of the chaos, and now I invite you on the podcast because I knew this conversation needed to happen because we just connected right away, and I'm really excited to make this happen. Uh, likewise, and I, I appreciate it, and I'm honored and humbled to be a part of your podcast. Thank you for having me. So, Roy, tell us a little bit about your Marine Corps experience, a little bit about your family, and where life is for you right now. Okay. Well, I joined the Marine Corps 2002, went to Okinawa, Japan, uh, 2004, moved to Nicosia, Cyprus, 2005, Kuwait City, Kuwait, 2007, Tokyo, Japan, and 2008 through 2010, back to Okinawa. And 2011 through 2013, I lived in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. And 2014, I moved back here to California, where I moved between San Diego, Count Pendleton, and uh, 29 Palms. So now, currently, I'm back in uh, Count Pendleton and 29 Palms. I'm a first sergeant with 19 years in. Well, it'll be 19 years this June. And, um, yeah. I have uh, my wife. She's the executive director of diversity, equity, and inclusion with the United Talent Agency. I have a daughter, Sydney Grace Moore. She's four. And my son, Maximus Benelli Moore. Well, yeah, that's his name. Sorry. My son, Maximus Benelli Moore. He's uh, 18 months. So we live in Los Angeles, California, currently. You commute to Camp Pendleton from Los Angeles? Yes. Isn't that like 45 minutes, if not longer? Well, in the, in the mornings, uh, with, with no traffic, uh, I can get the commute down to one hour. But in the evening times coming back, it's anywhere from two 
to four hours, give or take the traffic on what time I leave. What are you doing with all that time? Listening to audio books or just driving in and just thinking. And, and that's one reason a lot of people always ask. They always say it's like, um, isn't that commute? Like that, that's a, uh, that's a very long commute. What were you like again? To, the question you just asked: What are you doing during this time? Like I value my alone time so that I can evaluate myself and evaluate my thinking, and it also it, it enables me to shift mindsets from one perspective of life to another. So from home to base, that's a change, and then and then from base. Back to home is another change. And I have that time, I have that time to do so. Because one thing I've learned, if if I consistently listen to audiobooks between during that commute, I would stay, I would stay in one frame of thought the entire time. And it's not conducive to my performance or my uh, my mental elasticity because I'm constantly in that same frame, that frame of mind where I can't, I can't maneuver, I can't be as psychologically agile so certain days i listen to audio books certain days i listen to music and in those days i'm listening to music one of two things happening i'm deep uh in my thoughts or i'm actually just driving and i'm actually paying attention listening to the music where those that's it's a a conscious habit that i built i can actually listen to the music or make it um i guess background noise to help me concentrate on my thoughts. I often find when I was driving, I had a 30 minute commute and I would find that in the mornings I would do my self-development, like a podcast, audiobooks. but on the way home, if I was doing that, my brain would be just overstimulated. And I also found a couple different dichotomies with just having music on, because if I had a bad day, music would be kind of be that focal point that I would just keep orbiting around that same crappy thought all the way home. And then that's the thought that I would go home with. But I often found when I turned the music off and drove home 30 minutes in silence, like my thoughts would just bounce from thought to thought. And I wasn't necessarily ruminating the entire drive home on that thought. And it just allowed me to kind of get out of that rut and into a better frame of mind. Do you find that same thing sometimes? And that's exactly what I'm what I'm referring to. However, I haven't my commute is too long because I've tried it a couple of times. It's like you know I'm just going to ride home in silence. That's like Buddhist right. monk style if you can go yeah, like yeah, four yeah. hours without any yeah, any noise yeah, other than hon- yeah. horns honking. Yeah, just just complete just complete silence. It's like I could get uh, thirty minutes into it. But to your point, once I reach it, if if I have a thought where I'm not going to do anything but sit in silence. Once my mind begins cycling again and that thought leaves or I move on from that mental, that mental frame of thought, then, okay, now I've, I've relaxed mentally. Then I turn on the music and my mind, my thoughts will continue, will continue to cycle back and forth or, I, or I'll just think about something positive. I, I'll think about something I want to do at home or whatever. But in either case, I'm not, um, I'm not still stuck on that. Uh, that to your that, to your point, I'm still I'm not stuck on that negative thought anymore. So, be selfish. I'm going to ask two random questions. They aren't random because you you kind of teed them up. But I'm going to ask: Was it Marine Corps Embassy duty that got you to the Virgin Islands, or was some other uh, billet that I'm not aware of that takes you to cool places in the world? So, the U.S. Virgin Islands it's a U.S. territory, so we don't have an embassy there. But oh, however, sure. I put those together. It, I just instantly thought the Virgin Islands yeah. and the British Virgin Islands. Now, so, but however, to answer your question, it was embassy duty inadvertently that got me there because when I completed, uh, I completed embassy duty as a sergeant, and three years later, I was on the the hiss list, and so when when that came up, I did my binding request to a recruiting station Fort Lauderdale, and when I did, when so when I sent my binding request, the sergeant major he just replied back. I got you, staff sergeant. No, no, no greeting, just I got you, staff sergeant. So you know, I'm pumped up. I said, okay, Roger that, Roger that. So I'm just gonna take care of me. So I get there. So I go to recruiting school and the district sergeant major, he shows up and hand out the assignment. So where are you going? So he gives me my assignment. Never met this Marine before in my life. Obviously, you know that. 
because he's a 06 commander. Uh, so never met him before. He comes in, hand me this package, stats on it more. You go on to RSS San Juan, PC, uh, PCS St. Thomas. Our jets on major. And as he handed me this, this, this massive envelope with brochures and the rest of this nonsense, he hands it to me. And as I touch it, it's, it was something like in, in a drama scene out of a movie. As I grab the envelope, he holds on. He holds on to it, and he says to me, "Do you know why I sent you down there?" "No, I do not, Sergeant Major." "So because when you mess up, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take that rocker and two of those stripes. Good luck." Last time I spoke to the guy, sat down in my chair. Roger that, Sergeant Major. And he leaves. So in my mind, whatever, man, like, because, well, up to that point when I went there, I was the only successful Marine recruiter in the Virgin Islands for something like the last 50 years or some, something wild like that. So it was like a big thing that was going down there. So I get to the Virgin Islands. I fly to Florida for my onboard training where I meet the, 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 um, the recruiting station, Sergeant Major. Never met this Marine before in my life. He comes in, he sits down, he goes around the table. Who are you? I'm here. Okay, okay, okay. Hey, you stats on more, right? Yes, I am, Sergeant Major. You're in the Virgin Islands, huh? Yes, I am, Sergeant Major. You know why I sent you down there? No, I do not, Sergeant Major. So when you mess up, I'm going to take that rock and two of those stripes. Good luck. Roger that, Sergeant Major. He just, he just continued on talking. And it was like, then later on, he told me, he was like, when I looked at your profile, I saw that had successful tours in the, in the embassy on embassy duty. You were a staff, you were a staff NCO, and you were currently living overseas. So you seem like the best fit. But what? You just gonna tell me that? To start off with man. You had to you had to start with the shock and awe. You just whatever. But yeah, to answer your question, it was the embassy duty that landed me in the Virgin Islands. Yeah. I'm gonna ask another question following up within the Virgin Islands because I always love this question. What did that duty station teach you? Because I can only imagine the the beauty of what was surrounded, but there was probably an internal hell that you had to face every day of the internal obstacles. It made probably Okinawa and all the other duty stations like, man, those are walking the cakes. Yeah, yeah. Or walking it, the it, park, it, not it, walking yeah. the cakes. <laughs> I'm following you. I'm picking up what you're putting down, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> so... I learned a lot in a way of, believe it or not, personal personal development when I went to the Virgin Islands. I learned about sales and marketing and uh, establishing my separate community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Roger that. Um, that. I don't highlight that as much because all those things were par for the course was me being, because I opened the, the little office there on that island. So that was supposed to happen. I was supposed to learn how to speak. I was supposed to learn how to sell. I was supposed, I was supposed to learn how to market things in nature. However, what I was not expecting was not, well, I wouldn't say I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting it to the level to which it occurred. I didn't expect to grow as much as a leader and as a person as I did. And it occurred, I obviously it occurred over time, but there were uh, larger leaps in growth in certain periods of time. And so the first, the first thing I learned was, um, well, what was, what was taught to me and I continue to learn it is that it's extremely important on fulfilling my role to people, meaning that's the expectation people have of me as, as a person, as a Marine, as a father, as a friend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And whatever that, that expectation is, to, to, to fulfill my part of the relationship, I need to fulfill or exceed that expectation of me. And that expectation was identified like when I had those children and I was training them. And, and I began, as I began training them, first it started physical fitness. I really like a little fitness plan and they did it. And after they did it, I was like, well, you're the leader. It was this, this young, this young man named Trenton. He's a staff sergeant you now. I was like, he's like, what are we doing for PT staff? I don't, I don't know. You're the leader. I gave you a roster. I taught you how to do it. 
figure it out. We'll do it. Okay, we're going to do this, this, this. And, and he began telling me what he's going to do. Then I began teaching them about Marine Corps leadership. And I saw a change in them as young people, how they carried themselves, how they talked. And initially, I just thought, well, you know, again, it's part for the course. But it went much deeper than that when I started meeting their parents. When I met their parents, their parents began telling me things like, that change didn't occur until you came here. He or she didn't start doing it until they met you. That you brought about that change in them. You helped them to evolve to the person they're becoming and the person that they will be. Until that parent, those parents began to tell me those things. It was, I was so accustomed to just, and it's, and I, I don't, I'm trying to, and I don't mean in no way to come off and see it, but I was just used to developing people because that's what you're, and again, you notice when you become an NCO, hey, listen, you go to corpus course, these are leadership traits, these are leadership principles, this is how you teach, this is how you mentor, and it becomes a habitual habit that is just like, we don't understand the emphasis behind what we're doing in these people's lives. And so it just becomes another thing. But that changed for me when I was a recruiter and I saw these young people, they're not even in the Marine Corps. They're not a part of our culture. They're, they don't understand our culture. Nothing. They aspire to be us. They aspire to come in. However, they are still on the outside looking in. And I had this tremendous impact on them at such a mental and psychological level that it, reverber, it reverber, uh, reverberated back on me. So now I was like, and believe it or not, when the parents began told me that first, the first time I heard it, I was like, all right, Roger that. And then the second time I heard it, I started paying attention to it. I said, huh, that might be a thing. And then I started, and the island is only 23 square miles. So everywhere, every time I ran, I could literally run around the central part of the island and everybody would see me. And I would go to the schools and people and the teachers in the schools would say, you know, my students saw you, my students talking about you and my students, like, they really respect you. Now, now it's like, now I'm tracking. And then, and I guess it was something within me. It's like, I need to get better because I understand what your perception is of me, but I don't feel like to be honest with myself, I and this is me like doing that self evaluation. I don't feel like I'm meeting your expectation of me. I don't feel like I'm living up to what you think I am. And then that was that change. That was that was that, that, was that first change. Now, now, mind you, I'm still talking about marine stuff, right? Right, as a marine. Now, the second thing came into play when when I would release everybody and. I would be walking around just shopping or fishing or doing whatever I'm doing. And I have, and, and people see me and they, and people will come to me and say, like, Hey, are you the Marine? Yes, I am. I need help. I want to, I want to go to this college. I want to, I want to go to this branch of service. Can you help me? Yes. And a few times people came to me and said, I need, I have problems in my life. Can I talk to you about my problems? Then at that point, I, I realized the, the expectations, the perceptions, they transcend the Marine Corps. This is me now. Everybody's coming to me, Roy Moore, for help. So now, as a person, I had to evolve once more because I was a, I was a man before I put the uniform on. So the Marine can evolve, but the man can stay the same. So now, the evolution... I guess, you know, I guess you could say I evolved for a second time because now I'm, I'm evolved. I had to evolve as a person. And the third thing, the third thing was how do I sustain this upward trajectory? And the answer to that was constantly, constantly seeking self-education, constantly, constantly seeking mentorship from individuals external to the Marine Corps to add new perspectives to me. Because when you talk to somebody in the Marine Corps, they can, majority of the time, they can only mentor you, advise you from their reservoir 
of knowledge because we are both confined to the Marine Corps. However, I talked to somebody in the Air Force. I talked to somebody in the Army. I talked to somebody who works for the government. I talked to somebody who worked for Home Depot. I talked to somebody who worked for Amazon. I learned to turn people around me into a river of information, a river of knowledge. It's constantly flowing to me instead of feeding from a reservoir. Because when you feed from a reservoir, guess what? You can drink it dry. You can finish that meal. But a river, it constantly flows. It constantly flows. And turning individuals around me into a river of knowledge, into a river of information, I gain the ability or I, yeah, I stick with that. I gain the ability to add value to others. So I guess that's the third thing, adding value. How learn, I learned how to add value to people. Because oftentimes when you speak to someone, they'll, they'll speak to you to, with no consequence. And there always needs to be a consequence. And even if that individual is not holding you to a strict accountability, that needs to be a consequence to your mind. And like what's the purpose of me talking to you? Is this, is, is what I'm saying to you, is this thoughtful? Is it, is this helpful? Is it inspiring you? Is this, is this kind? You know, there, there are different things that um, you need to think about. And the last and most important thing is what I'm saying to you, is this necessary? Is this what you need? Not what I want to tell you, but is this the information that you need to hear right now? So those are the three things, the most prevalent things that I learned from being in Virginia. I know I had to go around the world to tell you that, but. Well, I am definitely glad that I used my own curiosity to talk about a Virgin Island that just sounded interesting because I felt like I had a, I think I told you when I talked to you the first time that one of my favorite interviewing techniques is to look for the Irish pinnets on the uniform, because when you pull those Irish pinnets and Irish pinnets are the loose threads on a Marine's uniform, we're the only ones that have a name for it. But when you yeah. pull those loose threads, <laughs> That's where the gold is in a podcast interview, and you just prove it beautifully. I saw a little Irish pin, and hey, that sounds interesting. I start pulling. Little did I know it was this almost like incubator of your early time in leadership. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it was. And there was a word that I, I don't remember, and maybe the Marine Corps uses this more now, but what you were really diving into, and this is what I've learned through fatherhood, whether it be in all walks of life. We often talk about leadership as we're leading Marines. Like that's something like that is talked about on a daily basis. You're leading Marines lead. That's what leadership is. But I actually have learned it to flip it on its head because it applies in this way to marriage, fatherhood, life, business. It's actually about self leadership. People don't follow you because you have the best ideas. People follow you because of the way you lead yourself. Yes. And that's what the people on the Island were doing. Like they saw someone that saw hope in themselves without anybody else giving it to them. And that in itself inspired a higher way of thinking. And they wanted to come along for the ride. And whether you're in your marriage, father, doesn't matter. They're always, your, your kids are looking for a better role model. Not that you have all the answers, but are you leading your life in a way that is, they can rise to. And that starts with self-leadership and the Marine Corps never, at least when I was in, never really used that term self-leadership that leadership is this idea that begins on the inside and is something that comes through on the outside. I always understood leadership for most of my life is just this idea that you keep Marines alive and you provide this guidance and you provide these good examples. But at the same time, you can still feel really hollow on the inside, even if you are a good leader in the Marine Corps eyes on the outside. Like what you were saying, like people are seeing this, but I didn't feel it on the inside yet. You want to be up every morning. You want to be the one out there in formation. You want to be the one that doesn't need to be told to do the right thing because you on the inside are already doing it from a place of this is how I'm going to lead my life. And that feeling that you do the right, th it goes back to integrity, which is another thing that's often thrown around the Marine Corps. But to me, the, the integrity component is, are you willing to do the right thing, not for other people, but for yourself? Because... Doing it for other people is is almost setting yourself up. At some point, it's going to fail. Those people that you rely on to, even especially when there's people in different ranks of the military where they rely on the subordinates to make them feel like they're in power. Like there's a moment that that's all going to be gone away and you're going to be left with nothing, which is why self-leadership needs to come from the inside 
And when you can do that, you you carry an abundant um, amount of energy and leadership and you just carry what you need to carry through life. And then fast forward to fatherhood. If we pivot to fatherhood, your kids are looking for the bar of what a man looks like. Your daughter, we were talking about before we get recorded about what it's like to bring a daughter into this world. She's going to go into the world to look for the man that her father was. You cannot set the bar high if you're not learning to lead yourself. All right, so you talk, are you pulling another Irish pennant there, man? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and that's one of the, and that's one of the, the most, you saying that, Raising a, raising a daughter is probably one of the most terrifying things that I've ever done because every, and I could be wrong, now I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, but this is just my opinion. For every, every woman out there that's broken, that's displaced, that... Um, that has has issues. The majority of them are because of their father, and the reason why I've, I've come to that conclusion because I'm reading this book. It's called uh, "Fathers, Father, Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters: Ten Secrets Every Father Should Know." I read that book when my daughter was two years old. That book scared me to death. Well, there you go. So, so now you understand what I'm saying. Oh, there you go. I'm so, speaking your language. I'm I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, so it's like I started reading this book, and it's like, yeah, and then like being as wild as I was, and and ripping and running across across the world, and seeing the things I've seen. And it's like now I have a daughter, and it's like, uh, you, I, I have this is, I have to do this right. I have to show her what, 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 uh, what strength, what, uh, what, what emotions are. In a, in a man and it's like uh you know it's uh it's a scary thing man it's a scary what thing, does the but- gentle touch of a, of a father's love look like because that's the, the kind of love that she's going to look for and she's and the other part like i always joke in the podcast and my listeners are probably going to hate that i'm going to use this example again but i always joke that the dad with a shotgun at the door is the dad that didn't set the bar high. If you set the bar high, you led yourself, you taught your daughter to find the value from the inside, not from the outside. She will always come to the conclusion, that guy's not my dad. Yes. Kick him to the curb. Yes. That will be a yes. logical conclusion that you you don't you don't need to be there for her because you spent your entire life representing to her what a masculine father looks like and what he, she should go out in the world to find someone to spend the rest of her life with. No. And you know that correlation you made it, again. It ties into to the it ties into the initial part of our conversation when it comes about being a leader. Because when you lead yourself, like you, you're not living just willy nilly. You're living by a set of principles, characteristics. You have you have parameters. You have rules. You have structure to your life. And the beautiful thing about structure, again, just as you said. People external to you, they can see your structure. They may not initially know what it is or what you're doing or where does it come from. They just know it's like that. There, there's something. There's something to it. There's something to this individual. And when it comes to our children, when it comes to our daughters, they're gonna. They see that structure not only and with and again that father's uh, gentle touch as as you phrased it. They experience that structure in a way like no one else can. Because when you speak to them, when you when you talk to them, when you hold her, when you hold her at night and, and kiss her on the forehead and tell her and tell her good night, and or you sit there, you sit there and you read to her, or when she just get up in the middle of the night and run to you, you carry her back to her bed and you're talking, you're talking to her, you're telling her there's nothing in the darkness. You can do it. You can be brave. You can be courageous. You can be outstanding. You can be all these different. You can be all these different things. That's you being that river and pouring into her. That's you overfilling her reservoir. So by the, by the time she grows into an adult, she's accustomed to receiving uh, information for external. Well, I wouldn't say receiving information, but uh, drawing information from external forces she knows not to exhaust her own reservoir and when she meets an individual 
that, that, that wants to be her partner, wants to be a part of her life, she would know instantly, again, just as you said, she would know instantly that this is another reservoir trying to connect to me, to drain me, vice. This is an individual that's a, a river of positiveness, of strength, of, and, and let's be honest, I'll say it, of, of worthiness to be with me, because just anybody can be, and, I, and that's something that I intend to intentionally like teach her. Everybody's not worthy to be with you, man. I'm sorry. Not because you're, not because you're daddy's daughter, but like that's life. Not everybody's good enough to be in your life. And I think uh, oftentimes when, when young people are growing up, or even when we were growing up, no one, oh, I speak for myself, no one ever told me that. No one ever told me everybody's not good enough to be in your life. Everybody's not good enough to have your love and affection. Everyone is not good enough to have your attention. If, and I feel like if you, if you tell a child that you tell a person that they're, they're naturally going to ask you, well, what do you mean? Because I told, I was told growing up, like everybody's good. Everybody's this. And then that's when the teaching starts. That's when the development starts. And it's like, they, there are certain things that you need to recognize in a person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when you begin to explain now, now what you're doing is you're putting your structure, you're putting your principles, you're putting in those traits and characteristics, you're verbalizing those things to her. Now, as she's looking at you and she's thinking, huh, that's why daddy does what he does. That's why daddy walks the way he does. That's why daddy talks the way he does. And then that, when that light bulb comes on, boom, her reservoir just deepened by five million leagues. And you now, now it's up to you to refill it, to refill it, to be her river and constantly refill her reservoir. So that way she doesn't need anything for anyone else. And I think and there's it, two powerful questions when you powerfully lead your daughter and your son through life that well, however long your life is on this earth, you want them to be able to always tap into dad's wisdom because dad's not always going to be here to guide me through it. And when you do what you just mentioned, you gift your kids the ability to always find a place, always find a way to tap into the most powerful question a kid can ask, what would dad do? Because when you do do that, when you lead your kids through their life and understand, help them understand where they're meant to go, you give them the ability to answer that question that no matter whether you're here 10 years, 20 years, however it may be, there's going to be a time when you're not, and they're going to wish that dad was, and they'll always know how to find and tap into that wisdom. And to me, that's like when, when you can create that type of emotional impact on your kids to always understand like, what would dad do and them instantly know what to do? You were there, you were present, you were doing the right things. I want to go a little bit deeper. I'm going to, I'm going to actually flip it on what we were just talking about, but we're going to talk about the same thing. So I actually carry a challenge coin in my pocket. This challenge coin is from the three Marine expeditionary force. I don't remember where I got it, but I like it because it has a Marine Corps or Eagle golden anchor on it. It says United States Marine Corps at the top reminds me honors courage from at the bottom. I've had challenge coins in my life for 15 to 18 years, however long I've had them. I've never known what to do with them. Until about two years ago, when a coach challenged me, and he was a Marine as well, he's like, I want you to take this coin and walk around with your pocket, and anytime you start doubting yourself, grab the coin and remind yourself that you're a United States Marine, and you're, you're stronger than the emotions that you're feeling. And everything that we were just talking about, I never actually framed it this way, so this is kind of a fresh thought, but a lot of self-leadership is actually, especially in the Marine Corps, if we flip it to Marines, is teaching the Marine that it's not something you wear, it's something from the inside out that as leaders in the Marine Corps and every branch of service, we're actually teaching them what we're actually are comes from the inside, that you don't just get to be a Marine because you have the Eagle Global Anchor and that you wear a uniform that makes you look like a Marine. No, you are a Marine, inside and out, whether you're in the military or not. And this challenge coin that I carry in my pocket is that reminder that when I'm feeling at my weakest, I grab that and remind, you know what, I'm a United States Marine. There's 250,000, however many millions of Marines that have come before me that represent being a Marine. I don't need to wear a uniform. That's something that's a feeling on the inside. And that came from when you start learning to lead yourself, you learn to tap into your own belief that you are capable of more. And then you start doing more. And then you start giving more. And 
to me, one of the favorite things that I loved doing in the Marine Corps when I was there was I, I was a platoon sergeant for three months. And the most favorite thing was to take the Marines that all the other NCOs had given up on and labeled ship bags and find the Marine and help them pull it out that they couldn't see themselves. And to me, that's what self-leadership is. When you are, when you can lead yourself in a way that you understand you're not a Marine because of what was issued to you, you're a Marine because of what's on the inside and that you learn to live your life with these values and people notice because there's not a lot of people that live their life at this high level as people in the military do. That's what self-leadership. And you're teaching your daughter the same thing, that her value comes from the inside, not from the outside. And self-leadership is that same way. Like She's going to lead herself through life without needing anybody else and anybody that she brings into her life. It's going to be to enhance it, not to make herself feel better. And the self-leadership or of uh, teaching the Marines that it's what, what's on the inside that, that matters and makes a Marine. The only, the only issue that is is that, well, I want to say issues, but the only difficult thing about that is, is that um, you can't do it if, if you don't have it. And if you don't have it, there's no way you can teach others. And the majority of issues that we run into today in, the, in our institution and outside, we as a people, as, as a world, is, is that, um, that self-leadership, that's not a soft skill that a lot of individuals. So, so it's also uh, called responsibility, which isn't something yeah. we are also good at either. That that self responsibility. Yeah. Um, I recently went through some uh, certification and training on parenting, and the entire premise of the process of parenting was that parenting really isn't about kids; it's more about us, and it's about us growing up. And that's a lot of what self leadership is when you grow up and realize you're the only one responsible to keeping yourself alive. And recognizing that, yeah, that was an immature, like we were, even before we even record, we were talking about how Marines will come into your office and they give you, I don't know why I did that. That was just an immature response. And it's an exercise that there are many people and a lot of them join the Marine Corps to grow up because they probably feel like they've just kind of waiting through life to figure out what's going on, but they still don't ever give that opportunity to grow up. But sometimes it's, I feel like a lot of people, especially maybe in the Marine Corps, you can uh, maybe disagree or agree to it, but a lot of them are just waiting for permission. I feel like that a lot of people just kind of wait that there's like this green light that they need to to see before they can step into who they think they can be. And if no one ever was in their life as a father or anybody really as a coach to say like, hey, no one's no one's going to give you permission. You can do it on your own. And that the permission to grow up is something I feel like a lot of people are just like in waiting. Like there's going to be something that happens that they're like, yeah, now it's my time to grow up. And a lot of times that never happens. And many people, I mean, there's 50 year olds that are still waiting to grow up. So we've all had the people in the workplace, the military where, man, that guy is just super immature and he still acts like a kid, not in a good way. And that, that switch, that responsibility switch, that is the mechanism that allows you to realize that, it comes from the inside that no one's going to give me permission and no one's going to care about my life more than I do. And what, what you just said, you, you summed up, that summed up my, uh, my last thought. And because again, when it, when it comes to that, uh, that self leadership, it's, it's important. It's incumbent upon a leader to, to know and understand when, to well, uh, not only, I won't necessarily understand, but to be able to recognize when a person is waiting to grow, and a part of a part of uh, development is is knowing where your people are in a, in a way of ability and willingness, and uh, how to get them to the next level. And if you don't if you don't have the ability to recognize when someone has the potential, but they're just holding back. They're just in a in a limbo state. Why? Why are they there? And what are you what are you doing about it? And and to your point, that's when you end up with all these adults that's just overly immature and you can't understand it because the transitions or in the ever in what you evolve to as a person, you can contribute it to the Marine Corps, you can contribute it to have a children, you can contribute it to wherever you like but you made that transition and people around you made that transition. When you see that one person that just missed out, what happened to you, man? Like, how are you not here where I am when you relatively had the same experiences I had? Well, to be quite honest, 
that person is there because you were fortunate enough to have a leader to recognize and exploit your potential. Where whereas this individual right here possibly just had managers. So that self leadership, man, that's a hell of a concept right there, man. I'm gonna start talking about that and teaching them again. Because to your point, I even until you mentioned that. I've never. And to me, it's the elephant I, in the room. Like it's, it, once you think about it, it's like, has this really been in the elephant in the room that we haven't really addressed? That because uh, it's, we often just dress it up with all this fancy knowledge and stuff. But at the end of the day, if you're not leading yourself, no one's going to follow. Yes. Yes. I mean, the worst NCOs, worst officers are the ones that do it because I said. Yep. Yep. And they're cool. the ones that aren't leading themselves and they're usually hiding behind the rank that they were issued. Yeah. And it's just like, I'm only doing this because it is. I'm not doing this because it's the right thing to do. I'm not doing this because this is going to enhance and evolve everybody. I'm not doing this because it's going to streamline this process. I'm only doing this because I have to. So, all right, Roger, you you the guy in charge, man. And, they, and, and you know... They won't step out of the way. They won't allow abstract thinking. They won't allow free thought. And it's like, all right, got it. Roger that. But to your point, wow, man, I can't believe I never, um, I never taught about that, man. I if you it, apply uh, it to marriage, which is something the military struggles with, I mean, in the Marine Corps, we struggle with this as well. In in the in marriage, the idea of self leadership. You can't go into marriage that you need something to fill a hole, which is often, I mean, if you think of broken men in the military, join the military to fill something that they didn't have from their parents, and then they find a woman to try to fill yeah. that void as well. That's yeah. not how the enrichment of marriage is supposed to work. It's, it, I always just quit. It's kind of a weird analogy, but I use Thanksgiving as an example. Thanksgiving is pretty good if you got mashed potatoes, you got stuffing and turkey. That's how you should be as a whole person. When you when you're leading yourself, you can meet all your basic needs. Marriage is the gravy. Yeah, gravy makes yeah. it better. Gravy doesn't yeah. replace something that you should already yeah. be able to do on your own. Yeah. And when you recognize that shift, it like I need to get to the point where I don't need my wife. I want my wife because if you need her, then you're always outsourcing some component of your leadership to her, and you don't control her. Yeah. And then uh, you get angry when she's not doing what you want to do and how you exactly. want to do it. And you don't know how to articulate your thoughts to her. And, now, and then well, you're no longer an adult adult marriage. You're a parent child. Like she's taking care yeah. of you as your child. And that's not something that's attractive either. Yeah. Women no, don't get no married to men so they can take care of the men for the rest of their life as a child. Yeah. Yeah. Because we didn't yeah. grow up. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You just blew my mind. I, mean, I can't believe I missed that. That's what you said the last time we talked. Yeah, well, I can't. What the thing is, now, now that we're talking about it like this, all right, this is this is something like I never deliberately taught. We probably we probably mentioned it. Yeah, you got to be a self leader. We probably yut yut it, but this was never a a deliberate, intentional discussion that I had. And you know what? This is wow, man. I mean, even NCO course, like think of just interjecting this seed that you're going to leave this course with an idea that you're now more capable to lead other Marines, but it actually doesn't start there. You are now more capable to lead yourself. Yes. Like yeah. that's what you get at graduation of NCO course, a higher capability to lead yourself, which then therefore will allow you to lead others more capable as well. Yeah. Because again, they, people, people begin to follow you because of your character. Your and, swagger, the way you walk. Like there's just yeah. something to that guy that I don't have and I want to have it. I'm going to follow him. And I, and I tell you, uh, John Maxwell always says leadership is influence, nothing more and nothing less, but your character, your behavior, your attitude enables that, that influence. So without, without your, without the, you, you, your character, there's no way you can build influence, whether it's with your people or your wife or your children. Like if you're, I, I talk to many dads and like, my kids just don't respect me. And I'm like, do you respect yourself? No, there's your problem. You just like, I'm dealing with an issue right now. 
and I'm trying to figure out why I ha- why I haven't I been able to reach them. And I'm doing a uh, a leadership uh, PME on um, on re- on resilience because I earned a certification a few months. The ago. military's favorite buzzword. That's what I'm learning about resilience. But well, the so- army actually like doubles down on it more than Marine Corps. Like the army thinks that resilience is like the best thing since sliced bread. So I'll tell you what I did. There's a uh, a Marine gunner. He started the Resilience Building Leadership Program, where you get a certification as a Resilience Building Leadership Professional Coach. Um, is coach, trainer, yeah, coach and trainer. And so I earned a certification as a Resilience Building Leadership Professional Trainer. And it, the course was amazing. Uh, so I went through the, through the module, then at the end I did a uh, three-hour oral exam. And so those principles, what he talked about in the resilience building, leadership building uh, course, that's when we're going to get a PME on. And this is what, what you just talked about, this self-leadership. That's, that's it right there, man. That's the piece of the puzzle that I'm missing to get my Marines. Because I'm, I'm with uh, the School of Infantry now. So I have a little small cadre of Marines that are combat instructors, you know? But you, know when they, you know when you go on the SDA, you get your 100 points and then you get promoted and now, boom, I'm sergeant and I have all this responsibility because at any given time, they're moving 100 to 200 people by themselves, just, just one or two sergeants, then they got it. And we, so they, they, do, they do the job correctly and they're efficient. However, there are some things that, you know, that can be tweaked here and there. And this thing that you just told me, uh, deliberately talking about self-leadership, Man, I can't believe I missed that. I even can go deeper, and I've also reframed it as masculine leadership. Like when you learn how to lead your own masculine energy into different, like with your daughter and different things, like being able to represent yourself as a strong, stable human being when someone else is having a rough seas. Like there's the ability to understand um, that sometimes someone else is having a hurricane and you need to be the oak tree. When you learn to lead yourself and calm down and you have your own inner calm on the inside, you're able to lead in an entirely different way. Like there's those leaders, I'm sure you can think of them that like, man, they're just like this tornado can be around them and they're just as calm. Like they've learned how to lead their masculine energy as well in those situations where they're not just locking down their emotions. They've learned to create the inner calm that allows them to lead themselves in a way that that they need to in those moments. So it's kind of this... um, duality to it that you, there's also the masculine energy that you can use and i've even as i've explored the masculine energy component i can make my four-year-old daughter stop crying just from giving her a big hug not saying a single word and just being there with her because if i can feel calm i can extend that energy to her without ever saying a word but you can't do that unless you start asking those hard questions about the self-leadership of and i have recently heard um People often talk about how the the best version of myself or my wife or things like that. You need to reframe that idea that in marriage, you want to actually be the best version of yourself that you can live with the rest of your life, not just your wife. Because when you do it for yourself, everything else will fall in place. When you become the version of yourself that you can live with the rest of your life, now we're talking. Because, yeah, and again, it goes back to what you were saying, like... Um... Doing things for others will will eventually always fail, but you can't you can't control how that person feels. You can't no. control, and I think that that's why a lot of people in transition out fail because that's the tools they used, and on the outside it doesn't work. I'm glad I talked to you tonight, man. <laughs> yeah. The only yeah. problem is it's Saturday now, so you got to wait a whole other day before you can get back to work to try something. Yeah. Well, I'm scared. I, I'm I'm talking to him on Monday, so yeah. I'm just and I'm just going to include this. I'm going to uh, put this put this just add self leadership to the to the slide deck. We're going to talk about this too. We're going to add this in here too. How y'all feel about this? And then boom, they're going to yeah, yeah, man. It's just I feel really terrible now because I I never. But you, you, your life was preparing you for the ability to articulate this, especially in the when we talk about Virgin Islands. Because that's what they noticed. That's what they were feeling was this man leads himself in a way. But then you also talked about that you were leading yourself on the outside, which is the part where you were issued the Marine Corps identity. So you were very comfortable being a Marine. And that's what they noticed. But you didn't feel that on the inside. 
And it took that extra growth to really get it in alignment that it's not just something that's issued to me on the outside to make me look great. I actually feel great on the inside and the Marine Corps, it just enhances it kind of like the gravy part. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like, that was your incubator to really begin to wither back this, this version of Roy Moore that we needed in the future. Yeah. But it, it is good that, that I, uh, I found out eventually, but it's, it's more significant when like uh, the individual actually know what's happening. You understand what's happening to you. So that way you can identify the feeling rapidly. And when, you be, when you're able to identify a feeling or emotion or an act, you can replicate it. Then not only can you replicate it, you can teach it to others. So I'm glad you have me figured out by myself uh about myself tonight but it's kind of like uh I don't, I don't know this this is something personal about me and it's kind of a every time i grow and learn more about leadership it's kind of a catch-22 because it's like yeah i learned something and i got better however i didn't know this until today and i and all of those people that i could have had a greater influence over or i could have added more value to them if i knew this that's where like the downside comes in because it's like now I'm thinking about all those people who just missed out on this uh, on this knowledge that I just gained. Do you have any ceremonies where you issue out challenge coins on a regular basis as a first sergeant or no? No, 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 I don't. I would even just spread the message to like maybe the sergeant major who does it that to me, a key, a key component, because I was never told what to do with these damn things. They were just issued. Like, here, thank you for doing your hard work at this working party. That we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. But to yeah. me, these challenge coins represent that this is your reminder that what you feel doesn't come from the outside. And like I said, when, when you doubt yourself as a human being and as a Marine, grab that coin in your pocket and remind yourself of it. Because you aren't just something that's issued on the outside that we did to you in boot camp. This is something that's in you forever. And that message next to these challenge coins should be something that carries everybody through that because we are not defined by our emotions. And today may be a bad day, but you are still United States Marine. Like that's never going to go away. And you're still backed up by all the millions of Marines that have come before you that died because so that you could be a Marine as well. Like, like all of that energy and history comes with us. And that to me is what I grab and hold on to when I grab the coin in my pocket. Do we even think of how many challenge coins, the opportunity for missed opportunities for challenge coins to maybe even prevent some of the suicide rates from happening because a challenge coin would be something a Marine carries when he's feeling dark. And that challenge coin, when he grips it, he reminds himself, like, I am more than the emotions that I'm feeling right now. I'm still a United States Marine. And something so small, what, what could have taken us a long way? You're right. Because that's what we forget. That echo inside of our head we lose all, all value of worth goes out the window when that truth comes in. Like maybe my family is better without me. Yeah. Well, Roy, I have absolutely loved this episode. I know you've got a movie night to get to. So I want to wrap up and I want to ask you for your best piece of dad advice. You've got two young kids. You can speak to the fellow military member that's on active duty. It doesn't matter wherever you feel your best piece of dad advice would land for someone out there. The best dad advice I would give a parent, both man and woman, is that um, when you have children, always remember your child is not the source of your frustration, of your anger, and of your stress. To give you an example, thing A will occur. You may not, um, you may not address it properly or you... You may shrug it off. Whatever the case may be, thing A happens. Your child is thing B. Thing B comes into your peripheral. Thing B comes into your mental space. And thing B does something completely arbitrary, completely innocent. And now thing B is where your frustration is aimed or pointed to. And in your mind, you just like, my child is my child is so much because I'm so I'm so stressed out and they're always crying. They're always spilling milk. They're always doing whatever they're doing. Basically, they're being a child. And oftentimes, 
parents will 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 not recognize that regardless of what my child is doing, how many times they do it or what they broke or whatever, whatever, my child is in no way, shape, or form the point of my stress, frustration, and anger. It's thing A that I failed to address properly. It's thing A that I failed to deal with in a mature adult manner. So parents out there, I would tell you that uh, in an event you missed thing A and you begin to get frustrated with your children, take a breath, pause, and think back and try and figure out what thing A is and go and deal with it. In the meantime, take a breath and remember, my baby, my child, my blood, you're not the point of my stress. You're not the point of my frustration. You're the thing I love most in the world. How can I ever get angry and frustrated at you when the only thing you want me to do is help you become the greatest version of yourself? That's the advice that I give to parents. And you crushed it. And you also just kind of uh, gift wrapped it and bow wrapped the idea of what you were talking about in that moment of where it's point A. Point A is the ability to have self-awareness, recognize your ability to change and lead yourself through the situation in a different way to get a different outcome. But it's having the integrity to recognize that you are the common, common denominator and that you have to find the right way to do the right thing. And that is self-leadership right there. I I look I didn't want to say all that because you said wrap it up. So like <laughs> hurry up. So, <laughs> so it's just like, but yeah, that's exactly and, and again, it like this conversation like led me to that thought, to your whole point, the whole point you've been making this this entire time. Self-leadership is so important in life as an adult, as a teenager, as a person that it enables you to deal with people, to be the best version of, your, of yourself and to avoid uh, irrational and illogical thought. You know what? I also had a, a interesting thought that just popped in my head. Self-leadership should be the rebranding exercise the Marine Corps does with safety briefs. Instead of worrying about putting a condom on before you go off base, it should be all focused on how you lead yourself is how you're going to lead your life. This weekend is an exercise for you to practice that. Good luck, Marines. <laughs> that's a, that, you know, that's actually a great safety brief. It's like, that's what I'm thinking. Like <laughs> I never heard a safety brief anywhere close to that. They were usually always just 20 minute blowhards about all these different things that we can't do. And none of that really ever worked. There was always still someone that did it. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't listening. I ain't hear it. But now you're in trouble. <laughs> well, Roy, thank you so much for giving me the gift of this conversation. I always love talking to other Marines. I've kind of been on a roll with talking to a few other Marines here. And it's just always great to connect with it. And the conversation that we had today was so rich that I know it's going to help a lot of dads out there because most of our problems start with the ability to lead ourselves. Like that's the most fundamental thing that you can look at our society as it is today responsibility is at the core and self-responsibility and we hit the nail on the head today. Thank you for having me on and the information you gave me. I uh, went, I went on ahead and I created me a podcast. It's called what did it take by Roy Moore is currently on Spotify. My first episode, which is my introduction, um, the product of Ben, Ben Kilroy's uh, uh, information and got it, you know, Thank you for that. And um, for all you listeners out there, I would appreciate it if you uh, check me out as well. Um, trying to just add add value to people. We'll go ahead and put a link to that in the show notes so that way people can get a hold of it a little bit quicker. And Roy, thank you for coming to my life. This friendship is just getting started. Yeah. And yeah. I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise, Ben. Thank you very much, man. It's, it's been great. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode with Roy Moore. I hope that this episode cut a chord deep within your understanding and pursuit to be a modern leader, a modern dad, 
Whatever you're pursuing in your life to be a better leader, I hope that this episode really gave you the courage to go out there and be a better person, not from an outward inward, but from an inward outward perspective. And before I share my big takeaway, I want to give a shout out to Ernest Gonzalez. Ernest Gonzalez has been a longtime friend, longtime supporter of this podcast all the way since the beginning. And he is crushing it down in Texas right now, working for a TA travel center with his own leadership and being able to become the number one TA center within their region for service sales. But the lesson that Ernest gave me about four to five years ago was he learned that this reflection on leadership within his military service as a soldier, that his attitude was a direct reflection of the leadership that he was around. Let me say that again. His attitude was a direct reflection of the leadership around. If he was a dick, most likely the leadership around him was a dick. And if he was being insubordinate, most likely the leadership around him was being insubordinate. And what that means and why this matters is because who we are on the inside is reflected on us on the outside. And what's ever reflected on the outside, other people around us absorb that type of leadership. They become who we are on the outside. And the people around us will only reflect back the insecurities, the things that you aren't talking about at dinner parties, that inner leadership that you're not acknowledging, that is self-leadership. And Ernest, thank you so much for being a listener of this podcast. Thank you so much for being a longtime friend. I can't tell you how many times I've counted on you and you've counted on me and we've always been there for each other. So thank you for that lesson. And then also just thank you for your awesome friendship. My big takeaway of this episode is pretty cut and dry, and I don't think it's going to become a surprise. That At the core of this podcast, at the core of coming home, the big rock, the big idea is this self-leadership. Your inability as a dad to come home is your inability to lead yourself in a way that you can trust. Let me say that again. Your inability to come home in your family, whichever way you're going, is most likely related to your inability to trust that you can actually do it. Trust to lead yourself through that journey because it's scary. But it takes a self-leadership mindset to go through that darkness that is your PTSD, your trauma, whatever it may be, whatever is preventing you from fully feeling like you're home. That self-leadership is the path. It is the path that I work with dads on. It is a path in my coaching program. All of that is about how do we cultivate a process to get you leading yourself into the direction that you want and get the right GPS coordinates for your destination where you want to go. It all begins with self-leadership. And this conversation was so rich within self-leadership, it is now going to be baked in all all my content because this word, this idea is going to be something that becomes a further understanding of where this podcast is going. So with that, I'm signing off. We are back to the podcast on Mondays. And as always, back to tradition, I will talk to you guys again on Friday. Friday.